Right. Well, it's lovely to see you all for this uh, reunion of Lodestone Poets that we've just been talking about. Um, um, as many of you will remember, they were founded in 2017 um, by Leslie Sharp, Dave Wakeley and Sarala Estruch. I'm going to pause for a second while people come in from the waiting room. <laughs> I'm seeing lots of hellos and looking forward to this very much in the chats from lots of people and telling us where they're from. Peckham. Shout out to Peckham. I used to live there. I know as soon as I start speaking again, there'll be a ding dong at the doorbell of someone appearing in the waiting <laughs> But I'm going to give it a go. Okay, so welcome everybody um, to this Lodestone Poets reunion. I'm really pleased that um, the Lit Fest stepped up um, and, yeah, I knew that would happen, and, um, and um, organised this event. Um, it's, it feels long overdue, actually. Um, so Lodestone Poets were founded in 2017 by the three people that you have see here, Dave Wakeley, Leslie Sharp and Sarala Estruch. Um, and the idea behind Lodestone Poets was to give a platform to established and emerging poets to read alongside each other. And they organised a series of events at Waterstones on Tottenham Court Road and at the Poetry Cafe. And there were emerging names who were emerging at the time and are now quite well known to us, like Mary Jean Chan, Raymond Andrews, and Gail McConnell, um, and reading alongside established poets like Jacqueline Zafra, Glyn Maxwell, and Tammy Yosilov. And their last event um, included the launch of the debut issue of Finnish Preachers magazine. And then, of course, COVID came along, um, and so they stopped meeting at Tottenham Court Road. But the, this reunion event is very special because the founders will be reading and introducing three of the poets who have previously appeared with Lodestone Poets. So the, the first person to read is going to be Dave Wakeley, who may well be known to many of you, but it's always interesting when you get the buyers for these things because you discover things about people. So uh, Dave has had a whole variety of roles, working as a musician, a university administrator, a poetry librarian at the poetry school, where I happen to know he met Stephen Spender on one occasion, covered in ice cream because he'd been looking after his grandchildren for the afternoon. Um, and he's also been an editor, and he's worked in locations as disparate as Bucharest, Notting Hill, and Milton Keynes. Um, since committing himself to writing, Dave has been shortlisted for the Manchester Fiction and Bath Short Story Awards, and his short stories have appeared in many literary magazines and anthologies. And convening Lodestone Poets has encouraged him to leave the dark side and go to the bright side into poetry. And so he, um, he has now become a published poet as well. And tonight, with thanks to their respective editors, he's going to read us work that has appeared in the fair the Alchemy Spoon and is due to appear shortly in the Grist Anthology. We are all in this together. So I hand over to Dave to read to you. Hello, everybody. And it's, it's lovely to be here. I'm going to start by sharing screen for the first poem. So bear with me a second. Is one of my <clears throat> ramshackle talents, I hope everybody can see that okay, is uh, as a calligrapher. Uh, and this is a poem which is, is kind of both the calligrapher's and the poet's dilemma in that you can throw any manner of really lovely language or beautifully scribed words at a page, but what are you actually saying and, and what does it all actually mean? Um, apologies to, to Chaucer, this is the Scrivener's tale. A mastic art in a godless age, perhaps, or a testament to the need to try. The bottled blood is never really necessary, the tempting true in its easy red gloss. 
but a sharpened nib has words to choose that a knife could never utter. Yet these words too will be corrupted, smeared or smudged by reckless hands, or washed away by the steady drip of time. Still I pledge myself to harpoon truth and pin it down with a razored feather, wriggling in its skin of definitions, and find myself legislator, magistrate and culprit, a diligent hand, but never quite impartial. An appropriate art for a godless age, perhaps, or a testament to the need to try. The second poem I'm going to read is is one that was published by The Fair. Uh, this is, I think I described it to Steve John, who's one of the editors, uh, when he chose it as, this is the kind of poem that a, that a man in his early 60s writes when he finds himself living in a new town, uh, which isn't such a new town anymore. And you, as a friend watch, once memory described Milton Keynes, oh, so this is what the future used to look like. Uh, which I thought was a great way of describing what happens to new towns eventually. It's about how how the future doesn't turn out how you hoped it might, uh, whether that's good or bad. Uh, it's called My England. My England. I sometimes catch it in the softest glimpses, the hints of red emulsion left under yellowing gloss, in souvenirs of love affairs that sparked as brief as safety matches in a windswept garden or a lavender barry glimpsed through a crowd on a man who isn't quite the one we buried. Or else in the choruses of old songs heard from passing cars, half-remembered accompaniments to half-forgotten marches, the banners and the slogans lost with their causes. Or else it comes in sharp reminders, the protest steward's lanyard still hanging from the spare room door handle, the washed-out union tea towel draped over the proving dough the hamster poor skeleton that breaks the surface whenever the dog digs under the rhododendrons. My England still exists in buried places, in festival photographs three layers deep on dusty pinboards and two coloured dusters torn from a rainbow t-shirt, daydreams forsaken like unfashionable toys. The yesterday's tomorrow's now, first drafts of prologues to unperformed plays, Ticket stubs for journeys not taken on branch lines to new homes that we never built. A ghost town cinema's coming soon posters for films that never played, their promises faded as a shuttered gay bar's purple stamp on a beer-soaked hungover hand. Futures not lived, like lint-covered peppermints in a mothball jacket pocket, anguishes abandoned like burned-out cars. Distant now is a horse martin's call from a tower block's eaves faint and far away a start. And uh, <clears throat> something less poignant and, and angrier, uh, I will do my best to be vitriolic for you. Uh, hard work on a Wednesday night, but we'll give it a whirl. Uh, I will have two poems published in a forthcoming anthology from Grist Books, who are based out of the creative writing department at the University of Huddersfield, and they're about to publish uh, an anthology called We're All In It Together, Poets for Poems for Disunited Kingdom, where I'm politely astonished to find myself sharing jacket cover with the, the likes of Gerald Taylor. Um, quite how that happened, I have no idea. Uh, but this owes a, a huge debt to Louis McNeese, so, so massive apologies to, to his estate, uh, but one of my favourite poets. Uh, and those of you that know his work will, will get the, the reference when I tell you the title. This is called Bagpipe Music 2022. Let's all hold hands and pretend it's all halcyon and nothing's gone rotten in darling old Albion. How could it be when we've such a fine champion burying his nose in the trough? Look how we sail with this hand on the rudder, this dickhead whose judgments could never be dudder. No matter how fiercely we tremble or shudder, there's just too much piss to shake off. He's putting the villain in villanelle, warping and wetting a cod latin spell while he's twinning the Garden of Eden with hell and then skipping off for a shag. He governs in gestures and grand gusts of words as clotted and curdled as yesterday's curds, selling false hope while we paddle in turds and offering a towel made of, towel made of flags. Now normality's gone to meet its maker, shall we welcome the Amish, the Puritans, Quakers, to sort wheat from chaff and heroes from fakers while we play angry birds on our phones. 
Let our children dig trenches to plant next year's carrots, to stuff in their ears, to silence the parrots who drown their concerns in subsidised clarence, clarets as red as the blood on our bones. Will good things still come if we patiently wait, or will compost and chalk be our ultimate fate? Let's shake when we meet at heaven's gate and talk about who is to blame. Let latter-day Jesus's ring hands for sinners while Mary's stay home and bring them their dinners, pimping the privilege of society's winners. Some things are always the same. There, uh, thank you very much. I can see lots of hands doing that, which is which is lovely. Uh, bless you. Uh, but let me introduce you to, if I can find my words, somebody whose poetry I very much admire. Uh, this is Ella Frears, uh, who I had the pleasure of meeting uh, some years back. We were both nominated and shortlisted for the Manchester Writing Prizes. Uh, Ella is a poet and artist based in London. Her collection, Shine Darling, which I thoroughly recommend, it's really wonderful. Uh, was shortlisted for both the Forward Prize for Best First Collection and the T.S. Eliot Prize for Poetry. Her latest pamphlet, I Am the Mother Cat, uh, published by Rough Trade Books, was written as part of her residency at John Hanside Gallery. And if I'm right, you are about to be poet in residence at Dartington Trust, which is something to hugely envy. What a beautiful place. Uh, let me introduce to you Ella Frins. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, thanks, Dave. What great poems. Um, uh, I'm really happy to be here. I've been really looking forward to this. Um, yeah, uh, obviously not done with Zoom readings. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've sort of got used to them. I, I don't know if you all have. You all look very comfortable, uh, <laughs> the ones I can see. Um, I'm going to start with a poem about uh, falling down an internet rabbit hole, um, which I'm sure lots of us have done over the last couple of years, <laughs> um, uh, rabbit hole. Under the hypnotist video, someone has posted the comment, now hypnotize a hypnotist to hypnotize you. The internet is hungry for itself. Not a snake, but a reply guy, legs in the air, straining to kiss his own genitals. Clicking through, I end up watching two very macho chiropractors, each with their own cult following. Due to the sheer number of fan requests, they set up to manipulate one another. Us chiros need adjustment too, being taken care of all those peeps. There's an atmosphere. The taller chiropractor elicits the loudest cracks. My man, he says tenderly, in response to every sound, my man. When they swap, the shorter touches the taller uneasily. He fails to get the neck to crack. The taller chiropractor stands straight as a rake and rests a hand on the shorter chiropractor's shoulder. I need some green trainers like yours, my man. Remove a rib and let the poem have itself for breakfast, I type in the comment section, then click back to that first video. The hypnotist tells the girl he's put under that when she wakes, she'll find the word hypnosis hilarious. There will be nothing funnier. He says, snapping his fingers before asking, how are you finding hypnosis? She laughs, hard and full and right in his face. And he laughs too, but in the manner of someone who doesn't quite get the joke. Um, <laughs> uh, so I um, went to art school for a year when I was 19 and um, I, like people do at art school, I made some weird stuff. Um, and I think that when I was um, when I was 19, I didn't really sort of understand or I hadn't sort of come across the sort of boundaries um, that uh, that art can sort of come up to. And, um, and I hadn't thought about what happens when you cross those boundaries and whether you should think about crossing those boundaries. Um, I sort of hadn't thought about the responsibility of art. Um, and we made something that I, um, I still feel a bit funny about. And um, this is called The Film. The sun was shining as we ambled around campus, stopping boys and men and asking them to hit me across the face. They all refused at first, but we told them it was art and necessary. So they slapped me, one after another. I realised I had to harden my eyes. 
provoke. Each boy did a comedy slap, palm to face, apologised before and after. It was hot and bright. We flirted with a geographer whose slap was light, his fingers just brushing my cheek as though turning my face to the side to see my profile. We had about 20 guys on film. My friend's boyfriend turned up and we asked if he would do it. He kissed her and stood to face me. My friend pressed record and said, go. And I was laughing, had forgotten to settle my face, my left cheek slightly pink from a day of slapping. I was not ready for his backhand. Quick and strong, a strange noise as though he'd slapped the laugh right off me, a thicker pain than a sting, an immediate loss of breath. For a moment, we were silent. And, I, and as I looked at my friend whose hand had flown to her cheek, the camera's red light still blinking, I knew we would never watch the film, that I would feel sick and guilty as long as the bruise lasted, longer, having asked for what wasn't mine. Um, cool. uh, I said I was used to Zoom readings. I forgot how weird it is, the, the sort of void of silence after a poem. Um, but you all look <laughs> like friendly and nice, so that's good. Um, yeah, God, I miss that like weird poetry noise that I used to hate that was like, ah. <laughs> um, but now I miss it. Um, so I had a, um, um, I did a residency with a conservation organization. Um, and uh, they were asking me to write um, about some of the most at-risk species in the UK. Um, so there were ants, there was an orchid, um, all sorts of things. And one of the things was a, a really rare species of moss um, that's found in Cornwall. Um, and there's only um, less than one square metre left of this moss in the world. <laughs> and that uh, is in Cornwall, tiny, tiny amount of this moss left. Um, and uh, somewhere along the line, they they sort of thought that they told me the location of this moss, um, and I would get calls w at, at weird times um, saying, "Please don't tell anyone where it is," uh, which was, um, I mean, I didn't, I couldn't. I think they thought I was going to go and sort of um, trample it, uh, and um, they didn't, they wouldn't show me, they wouldn't take me there, they wouldn't take me to see it, and um, they couldn't tell me too much about it. They didn't want to because they said it complicated. Um, sort of issues around conservation. It was a, a complicated species. I still don't know what that means. Um, and I uh, I began to think that the moss didn't exist. <laughs> it was all a joke. Um, and I, I saw so I wrote this very tiny poem in that state of, of mind. <laughs> Becoming moss. I lie on the ground, I open my mouth, I suck on a spoon, I embrace a stone. A beetle crawls by, I empty my mind, I stuff it with grass. I'm green, I repeat. The sun is a drink, the yellow is squash. I can't get enough, 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 I can't get enough. Yeah, so I did this, um, I had this residency last, I keep talking about residency, sorry, that's um, basically um, my sort of poetic practice relies on deadlines because I'm um, not a finisher. And so um, I've set up um, a, a sort of a practice where I sort of hop from residency to residency because I like that sort of switch in subject matter and I like to be in new spaces talking to new people and sort of I think that my work is responsive I don't think I, I know now having done a year of not writing in the pandemic at the very beginning um that I that I need those deadlines um in order to finish things um and so that's uh why if anyone doesn't know what a residency is it's just like sort of um an organization or a space or a gallery or something will ask you to come for a, for a period of time usually around six months for me um, I don't, it's different for everyone, I think, um, to, to write in response to something that's there. Um, so I, um, yeah, I, I had this uh, residency at the John Hansard Gallery in Southampton, um, which is a brilliant contemporary art gallery. And um, one of the films there was um, by an artist called Morgan Quaintance. It was a film called Missing Time, um, really beautiful film, if any of you get a chance to see it ever, if you see it on somewhere. Um, 
And the film was made sort of using archival footage. Um, and one of the bits of archival footage was um, some medical hypnosis, some old footage of a medical hypnosis happening to a war veteran. Um, hence the hypnosis uh, in the beginning of the, the, the reading <laughs> that other poem. Um, but I became really, really obsessed with watching YouTube videos of um, hypnotists, stage hypnotists particularly, I find. I'm sorry if there are any in this um, Zoom room, but um, I find them incredibly creepy. Um, so the stage ones, I know that there's a sort of medical or, th or therapeutic use for hypnosis, but I've no I haven't experienced hypnosis ever, but the, the stage ones seem to be mostly men and they, the people that they bring up on stage tend to be mostly very young women. Um, and I find that sort of power dynamic um, really bizarre. And, um, and I became sort of obsessed with this sort of their, their techniques So like clicking is one, um, the way they sort of put, put your, your balance or sort of distract you and uh, to make, to put you under. Um, and so I thought it'd be fun to write a poem in the voice of a hypnotist. Um, and uh, another thing in Morgan Quaintance's film, Missing Time, is that there was, a, I noticed there was a lot of sort of movement between light and shade. Um, so like a train going into a tunnel, a lamp being switched off, a cupboard door closing. Um, and so I um, I decided to write light and shade in the, in the voice of a hypnotist, in the manner of a hypnotist. I'm gonna, it's quite a... Uh, <laughs> Light and shade in the manner of a hypnotist. Focus, 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 and sleep. My raised hand is no longer a hand, it's a lamp, a dentist lamp. Uh, you're tipped back in your chair, strong sound of latex. The dentist is softly reciting your teeth. One eight, one seven, one six, fish is sealant. Your gaze is fixed on that lamp, so bright it hurts. With every second you stare, that circle of light is burned deeper into your vision, deeper so that even when you're not looking at the lamp, you see its shape and reflect, imprinted on the walls, on the ceiling, on the dentist's face. When I snap my fingers again, you'll find that you are that circle of light. You're the sun. You're the hot round sun and you're hard at work burning the mist off a dawn clearing. All your energy is focused on evaporating the dew, steam rising off every blade of grass, off the body of a sleeping doe, the top milliliter of the surface of a lake getting warmer, warmer, and then night. You're a star suspended in the wide blank universe alone, sobbing radiation through the void, and it feels as though you're falling, as though you're sinking, and you are not space, but water. You're underwater. Above you is a thick sheet of ice, translucent, blocking the sun like an eyelid that's been frozen shut, and you're falling. Slow, a dead weight, a dead whale. You're heavy, sinking deeper down into a deep marine trench, and the deeper you go, the darker it is. The deeper you go, the darker it is that there thousands of Antarctic krill and a sudden swarm of Antarctic krill, their organs glowing yellow green, heartbreaking, these tiny bioluminescent Antarctic krill. You reach out to touch, but they're no longer Antarctic krill. Not krill, but candles, you're in a shadowy chapel. You're in a shadowy chapel and the only light is coming from the thin tapers lit that day for the dead. Every taper is a memory, you have a memory. You take a match out of the matchbox and hold both match and matchbox and as you strike the match, warm soft light floods in from every angle, enveloping you like a soft golden bath and there's laughter. You're at a party, a drink in your hand, you're effervescent, dazzling a small group of strangers in someone's kitchen, a light emitting diode of a woman. But here, right here on your back is a dimmer switch, feel it. And every time I snap my fingers, your personality dims a few lumens, dimmer. They're transfixed, but you can't remember how your anecdote ends. It's gone on too long, it's about to run aground, dimmer. You're asking the host about the wine you're drinking, its origin, its year, dimmer. You're asking the price point. The person you're talking to looks cornered, but you're scared to be alone, so you keep talking. Dimmer, you've slipped an antique cigarette case into your bag. Dimmer, you're giving a man bad financial advice while staring at his wife's breasts. Even dimmer, you switched off their freezer, tipped a whole cake into a drawer and closed it. Dimmer, you've poked crest seeds into the, into the thick pile of their carpets and watered them. You've wiped your bum on a fluffy white towel. Dimmer and dimmer. Who invited you, people are wondering. Does anyone actually know her? Friend of Bill's, you say, but there is no Bill. Dimmer. And you wonder too now how you got here, slamming the door repeatedly against the host's head while watching the city lit and gorgeous pass by through a police car window. But it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. When I snap my fingers, it's granny driving. And you're small. You're kicking your little legs on the back seat like an Antarctic grill. The road ahead is tree-lined. You lean your head against the window and watch the dappled sun flicker as the car speeds along. You close your eyes and watch the insides of your eyelids change from golden red to blue-black. Light shade, light shade, you whisper. Light shade. You're a sequin reflecting the strobe on a dance floor. 
a torch in the hands of a camper looking for his toothbrush in a pitch black tent, a Bunsen burner, foot lightning, a pair of car headlights swinging around a sharp bend, the underside of a bush, a Hitchcock villain's a tennis player's eyes beneath her visor, forthright, sear, break, peak, bourgainvillea, thud, soupçon, crush, pearl, bracken, says the dentist. Light shade, light shade, you're whispering still. You're in a hot train station platform, flat, hot concrete, dizzy in the glare, your shoulders gently frying. Light shade, light shade. Look, you've forgotten your name. You always knew your name, but now your name is. Your name is. Thanks. <laughs> Um, I'm going to read, I, I don't know how, I'm going to read one more, <laughs> um, uh, short one. Um, I grew up in, in Cornwall. Fucking in Cornwall. The rain is thick and there's half a rainbow over the damp beach. Just put your hand up my top. I've walked around that local museum a hundred times and I've decided that the tiny stuffed dog, labelled the smallest dog in the world, is a fake. Kiss me in a pasty shop with all the ovens on. I've had a warm new egg on a farm and thought about fucking. I've had a tiny green crab in the palm of my hand. I pulled my sleeve over my fingers and picked a nettle and held it to a boy's throat like a sword. Unlace my shoes in that alley and lift me gently onto the bins. The bright morning sun is coming and coming and the holiday children have their yellow buckets ready. Do you remember what it felt like to dig a hole all day with a plastic spade, just to watch it fill with sea? I want it like that, like water feeling its way over an edge, like two bright red anemones in a rock pool, tentacles waving ecstatically, like the gorse has caught fire across the moors, and you are the ghost of a fisherman who always hated land. Thank you. And uh, it's my very great pleasure to introduce Rebecca, who uh, Rebecca Goss is uh, a poet, a tutor and a mentor living in Suffolk. And her second collection, Her Birth, was published by Carcanet Northern House in 2013 and was shortlisted for the 2013 Forward Prize for Best Collection. Girl, published again by Carcanet and Northern House in 2019, was shortlisted for the East Anglian Book Awards 2019. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Rebecca. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much for that. Hello, everyone. I I, I don't quite know how I'm going to follow everything that's happened so far, quite frankly, because um, that was all um, brilliant. They're amazing poems, um, and it's a pleasure to read with everyone. Um, Yes, so I'm going to read all new work, which is pretty scary, but um, always good to road test these things. And um, they're going to be poems from what I hope will be my next collection. And it's all set based around inspired by Suffolk. <laughs> Not a place a lot of people rush to, but um, anyway, it's uh, that's where it is. Nest. The signets draw a crowd before they are born. Mother swans occasional rise to nudge her ovate crop, beak slow and practiced at the turning. Father swans circling, rearing at dogs. We return to see one, peeping, puff of gray from under her, and the next week come back to find a family gone. One unhatched, remaining, its marble lonely in the bowl. Your hand slips out of mine, and as you bolt to waiting slide, swings, leaving me with the egg and all mothers who lay their babies down, knowing they cannot stay beside them, must lower their own bodies into water and continue with the swim. The Pact. Hay, recently harvested, turned to those sweet smelling blocks, barn stacked, almost to the roof, forbidden. Only the dog watched our clamber, taking us to where the swallows come, and up there we leapt and trod the dry bundles, our elevated play. Then one of us was gone, slipped unnoticed into a gap our parents warned us of, how this strawy structure could snatch a boy or girl, and the plummet would be too great, too narrow to save them. 
We needed to hear him before we lay our chests at the edge of the hole. My arm voted longest to stab into the deep, a reaching into myth until I felt his plump hand and heaved, watched his flop into the light. Circled, trembling, we tried to still our breathing, made the necessary promise, headed back to the house and kitchen, mother cooking, the fall, a secret held far into our adult lives. Forever haunted by its morphing. The drop deeper, our mother unable to remember what made her look out of the window. Maybe she felt us coming, or maybe our approaching shadows interfered with the light. Standing at the glass, the smell of leek and potato soup suddenly strong, yet she ignored its simmer to watch her children running. Middle boy screaming, she couldn't hear it but could tell by the stretch of his mouth. Middle girl behind him, struggling to keep up, glasses loose on her face. Eldest leading the terrible flea, white pumps spitting gravel. The barn looming in black behind them, unable to see her youngest boy, her youngest boy not with them, her youngest boy not pulled from that warm well. Thank you very much, everyone. Look forward to hear the rest. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I, I think I can probably speak for most of the audience. I don't think you should feel intimidated about writing nature poems at all. Um, you bring a, a unique perspective to them. That was that was wonderful. Um, and as someone who grew up in Norfolk, you know, the stuff about doing things you shouldn't do in with um, straw bales was very familiar, although no, nothing as dramatic as that happened to us. Um, so we're now on to our penultimate um, poet. Um, who I'm really pleased to introduce to you. This is Sarala Estruch, who's a British poet and a writer of mixed European and Indian heritage. She's a winner of the Poetry School Nine Arches Press Primers competition, and she has been a member of the Library Critics Collective. Her debut pamphlet, Say, was published by Flip Die in 2021, and she's currently working on her first full collection. And I suspect she might be reading us some poems from that, perhaps. But anyway, welcome. Thank you, Caroline. Thanks so much. Um, gosh, what an evening we've had so far. Thank you to everyone who's come. Thank you to the amazing poets we've had so far. Um, thank you to Milton Keynes Literary Festival for making this happen. Um, I'm really delighted that Lodestone Poets is having this revival. Um, I'm going to read three poems. Uh, I think I'll do two from my pamphlet, Say, and then one from um, the new collection, which um, is going to be coming out with Nine Arches Press in um, early 2023. Um, and I'm going to start with the opening poem of uh, the pamphlet, um, which I don't know if it needs an introduction. I'll, I'll just go straight into it. After silence, the return of song. You couldn't have imagined it before it happened. But after, sitting behind the locked door of your house, you can't unimagine it. Your head an echoing of what was and is and why. Back pressed to skirting, you listen to the silence of walls, the way wallpaper masks the secret of brick, cement, plaster. How you'd never for one moment guess that something so whole could simply be an assembly of disparate parts and some of them so small and infinitely breakable. The rupture steals your words. Silence, a river that smothers. Till you begin to search. First, the usual places. Desk drawers, filing cabinets, under the bed. Then the inside of a bag of basmati, the fold in the skin behind your ears, the dark curving tunnel 
of your throat. Eventually, you give up and find it jammed between your steepled palms. Not words, but the bribe required to coax words from hiding. So the, the pamphlet is um, primarily about grief, um, about a variety of griefs, um, specifically childhood bereavement, um, but also that poem is sort of a pandemic poem. It was sort of that moment when having all the doors closed sort of brings home a lot of perhaps a lot of griefs that may have been lying beneath the surface, but when there's all the silence, sort of lots of griefs come rushing in. Um, yeah, so the book, the book collect, um, examines various forms of grief and um, sort of intergenerational trauma as well. Um, but it also celebrates song um, and yeah, poetry. Um, so I'll, the next poem I'll read is um, called Guzzle Say. Um, I thought it'd be a good poem to follow the first poem um, because it is about the power of music and uh, poetry. Um, okay, so it's um, Guzzle Say and it's after Will Harris. There is no definable point at which a living organism dies, scientists say. It shakes me to read words I've been striving all these years to find, to say. The universe is rarely ordered in binary ways. How to articulate this basic and profound truth my mind struggles to believe, let alone say. All I know is you've been gone these long years and at the same time, you haven't. You've been right here. Though till now, it's not something I thought I could say. Dead and alive are terms whose meanings are wholly psychological. Physiochemically, they merge into one another. They bleed, you could say. Bleed the way my knee did, releasing its dark stain. Running too fast to meet you, I fall. And what was once inside me, now on your hands, your blue shirt. Sorry, I say. You pull me close. In the garden beside the alley in which we crouch, the chestnut trees are whispering, a sound only half got out. Sorry, you say. The whispering grows louder, reverberates in my ear, my throat. Father and poet, Tell me honestly, what are you, what am I trying to say? And final poem. So I've realized I've got a bit of a throat. I've had a bit of a cold today, but I um, hope, hope my voice keeps up. And the final poem, I um, thought I'd read something a little bit more cheerful, um, sort of cheerful a bit more energetic. Um, it's called Flight or On Reading Ada Lamon. There is so much living we miss out on because of fear. Like that plane we missed by a millisecond because we hesitated for a nanosecond before stepping onto the escalator or through the precarious doors of the lift. And when I see us standing here on the runway of our lives, as the jet flies over our heads and the clock tick tocks impervious, sometimes it's all I can do to stop this vessel from self-combusting. 
You want the truth? These poems make me want to take life by the neck and shake it up. Enough to tell us what we need to know, how to race the clock and overtake, leave time gasping on the asphalt. Thank you so much. So those are my poems. Um, and now it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our final poet of the evening, uh, Roy McFarlane. Roy McFarlane was born in Birmingham of Jamaican parentage and has spent most of his years living in Wolverhampton. Currently Canal Laureate England and Wales and the Birmingham, Birmingham and Midland Institute's Poet in Residence. He has previously held the roles of Birmingham's Poet Laureate and Starbucks's Poet in Residence. His collections, beginning with your last breath and the healing next time are published by Nine Arches Press. And I'm really looking forward to hearing um, what Roy has in store for us this evening. Over to you, Roy. Ah, I was so relaxed. You know, when, when I'm like chilling here, having such an amazing time, beautiful poetry. And then somebody says the penultimate poet. And I think, shit, is, am I good? Sorry, I shouldn't say shit, should I? Uh, is, is it? Oh, my God. Are we there? Are we there? So, yes, Sar Sar Sarada, thank you for that introduction. Beautiful poetry. Love the pamphlet that you've got out. Um, all the other poets. Oh, amazing. Yeah, you want me to shut up and give you some poetry now, don't you? Okay, I, I'm going to give you a poem, right? You, you've got to promise me that this poem I'm giving you, right? Um, this is the first poem I've written for as, as my position as Canal Poet Laureate, right? But I'm supposed to be waiting until it comes out, right? So you have got to pretend that when it does come out, you never heard it before, right? You need to have that shock on your face. Oh my God, I've never seen this poem before, right? Please, 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 please. So this one's called Under a Winter Solstice Sky. And during lockdown, um, before I got the post of, of, of Canal Laureate, I used to walk along the canals. It was my way, it was my well-being. Is the um, living in Tipton in a very urban set setting. There's not much greenery in Tipton, and um, this canal. It was such an outlet. And to go back several years later, because I've moved from Tipton, and to go back to start my journey from Coesley Canal Tunnel. At the back of Roseville Methodist Church, moss and tufts of grass make a patchwork quilt, covering broken tarmac and rough terrain. Here, a gap appears in a palisade of fencing, a portal onto another world. You stand with a bird's eye view and watch a vein of water feed from a tunnel below you into the arm of this hidden underworld. The kiss kiss and warble sounds of birds seduce you, descending down into this wonderland of the white lady who searches for her lost children and squirrels, squirrels playing and jumping from tree to tree. And there's always a heron a heron that welcomes me and spreads her wings and leads the way where trees are leaning, avoiding the eternal slide down banks into charming waters. Other trees fallen, bushes converted to the song of the canal, bend and drink at the water's edge. Walk under a bridge. And you'll find on a steep bank, a discarded bumper, a McDonald cup, a coffee, a Coca-Cola tin, and a running shoe, a single running shoe, all a reminder of the world above. And you see her, and you see her amongst the cattails and reeds, still. 
neck raised straight, periscope height, lengthened lung, statuesque still, and then she moves smooth criminal, the lean forward. She walks on water, leaving little trace. Still, neck drawn in, S-shaped saber, ready for the lunge. She sees something. You both stay still amongst the sounds of industrial roller shutters pulling in their neck, HGVs stampeding by, and a train roaring. You both stay still. And the heron flies away. Further along, after the waters bend, where coots slow slalom through reeds and the water is clearer. Luminous green star plants shine underwater, enraptured from another world. Locks, these ancient keepers of waters, locks who have known waters, industrial waters, leisure waters, working waters, enchanting waters, locks who have known waters under a winter solstice sky. Thank you. So part of this journey, like I told you about the heron, this heron is, I know it's not the same heron, or it could be, I don't know, but I'm always seeing this heron as I'm going along this canal. And it is so majestic, a bit awkward, a bit lanky and leggy, but oh, when that thing flies and spreads its wings, it is the most beautiful, glorious thing. I would never imagine good old Roy McFarland would be suddenly becoming a bird watcher. I have no idea what's happened to me, but here we go. This one's called, this was written, yeah, it was written a while ago. No, it's not the other one, it's this one, it's the other one. Okay, it's this one, here we go, sorry. To the Herod who stood with me in the ruins of another black man's life. And this is part of a collection that's coming out in October called Living by Troubled Waters. And um, yeah, there's a lot going on in there. And uh, one of the opening poems was written, I, I, I just couldn't cope with the idea in those few months after George Floyd had been murdered and it, 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 I, I couldn't write, I could not write. And so in my collection, the first opening poem declares that I couldn't write. And then you, you, you get this poem and, and, and there's a heron in that poem. And then this is a, the book ending poem at the end called To the Heron Who Stood With Me in the Ruins of Another Black Man's Life after Gwendolyn Brooks and Gil Scott Heron. To the heron long and lean, standing still on the corners where the waters bend. To the heron gracefully gray, poised at the water's edge. To the heron painted in the tapestry of reeds, waiting, waiting. I want to learn the art of waiting in these dread full times. Thick engulfing choking times. To the heron long limbed, taking one, two steps, stretching those wings, leaping like Michael Jordan, to rise in brilliance to all herons from the lineage of Bennu, he who came into being by himself. To all the herons left school, real cool to the heron lurking late in summertime, to the heron with the slow wing beats of a double bass on a jazz June evening, to the heron motionless, still standing still, to Gil Scott Heron, whilst I'm here standing in the ruins of another black man's life, I am death, cried the vulture for the people of the light, yet, here we stand on the muddy banks, alive, longing for change. 
to all those gliding towards the sunset. Beautiful is your name. Thank you. I'm gonna take you back to one of my previous co collections, um, The Healing Next Time. Um, I was, you know, you, you put your poems together and I'd read the most, oh, this morning I, I, I read about a young black girl, age 15, was strip searched at school. Police officers were called in to strip, and, and, and she was strip searched. She was on her period. She was only 15, a black young girl. And, 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 and you know, it's 2022 and systemic racism and all this, all this thing is still going on. And, and, and we, oh. and so this poem came to me about Joy Gardner. And I thought I wanted to share this with you. Um, Joy Gardner, for those who don't know, 1993 died uh, there's a whole series of poems about deaths in custody and the healing next time this is a, a quote from a mother at a, a public public meeting i couldn't believe that human beings could be so cruel to another human being you know it makes you cringe to hear as a mother of what they did to my daughter in that sitting room they tape up my data 13 feet of tape, adhesive, sticky tape, a body belt, chains, handcuffs, and tape. Bounded her, taped her, tied her up. Taped her head like a mummy for the ear after. And right here, after she ceased to breathe, they made a mixtape longer than any tape measure could measure. Police, judiciary, and hospital taped together a tapestry of events and kept a corpse alive until they could taper their stories to a rounded tip. A mother is bounded by the red tape of officialdom until things taper off. But a mother lights a taper in the darkness until my tears will catch them. My tears will catch them. All right, okay, okay. Let me bring you back to my collection again. Another thing I was trying in this collection is I want to gather the stories. My mom used to tell me stories when she was growing up. And also I grew up in a very Pentecostal, Pentecostal hardcore, like it was hardcore church. Um, I was a young preacher and yeah, I was caught up well into this. My dad was a deacon and um, and it's going to be the first time I'm actually going to gather those stories and those things because there are these are the traditions, these are the these are the intricate cultural things that make us who we are. So whether we are in villages and we and or whether we are on the edge uh, at the tip of Scotland or at the bottom of Cornwall, there are these beautiful intricate stories that make us British and make us who we are, coming from all directions and places. And I just thought, we need to capture these stories. So here we go. This one's called Laying of Hands. And um, yeah, hopefully it'll explain itself. And it's in three parts. Man to man. Hands on his back. Let him know you're there. He leans into you. He moves off you. He signals for the ball. I'm gonna take you to the ring. He gets the ball, he shimmers to one side, you hold the lane. He comes into, you lay your hands on him. He backs off you, crossovers and fakes, the ball between the legs to go one way, but you know him, as if you were gods who had played with the moons of Jupiter. The ball behind the back to go the other way. He's got the lane and he's got the drive. Now it's on, body to body contact, the press of flesh, the exchange of sweat, the alignment of planets, both pull into each other's momentum, defying gravity, bodies 
arch in celestial flight. The ball hits the ring and we both fall to earth. Part two, after a basketball game, she takes off your top, lays her hand on you, pushes you against the wall, while Janet Jackson sings anytime and any place. Mm. She kneels before you, tongue leaving a trail of intentions across your torso, her mouth opens for only communion, to take of your body, to take it all. Janet continues to sing, sing, skirt around my waist, wall against my face. Your hands find the small of her waist, fingers still wet, her body varnished with sweat, saliva, and sweet kisses. And she speaks your name. And you're speaking in tongues. While bodies shiver, you press against the wall, holding her as a goddess. I'm not going to stop. No, no, no. Knowing if you release her, the night would come and she would disappear. And whatever blessings you have for each other will dissipate into the darkness. So you push deeper, you hold tighter, and together you make hymns rising to the heavens. Part three. After an evening of loving, body sweating, Heavy breathing, I slip into the back pews, praying nobody noticed. Can a man hide in the secret places where I cannot see him? The preacher warns. His hands lift to the heavens, the same hands raised to beat me. But mother's hand softly on his shoulder held him back. Do I not feel the heavens and the earth? My father's hands that knows the soil of the black country. A father that lives by the codes of almanacs, wait for new moons to rise before new seeds were planted, planting seeds of hope in people living in a strange land. Come unto me, all that labor, and I will give you rest. And before I know it, I'm praying. I'm falling on the floor. I'm being touched by the spirit, hands raised, body bucking, becoming a vessel of emotions overflowing with tears. After we hold each other, laying hands on one another in a flood of praise and song. Thank you. And finally, so I think time is going. I'll miss, miss one out. I won't hold you no longer. Um, and this is something that I have just written. And it's amazing how a book evolves in your hands while you're putting it together. You're getting it ready to go to your publisher. You had, a, had an idea six months or two years ago. And by the time you come to this last poem, you're thinking, this has evolved. And um, anybody who's happened to have read my collections and both collections will know mom always appears in my collection. Mom passed away in 2014. And Oh, what an incredible mother. And funny enough, in the third collection, there's a whole section about mom again. So I'm sorry if you've been following me, mom's come again, right? But not just mom, numerous mom, mothers who brought me up in, 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 in my life. And I've never written about my dad. Many, many people have asked me, you don't write about your dad. I don't know why, I don't know why. But in the last couple of months, dad has come, and dad died in 1990. And suddenly I'm remembering stuff and I'm writing stuff. So this poem I'm gonna leave with you. And I know when I wrote it, I cried. So, and, uh, I, okay. You left in between the snowdrops that fell. In my world of floppy disk and hard drives, and Christmas around the corner, I get a phone call. You need to come to the hospital. The day before, you were supposed to be coming home. You heard my mother struggle 
to move you from bed to chair. A practice run for what life would be, moving your stroke hit body like a mighty oak. You were leaning, heavy, struck by lightning. I see my mom at the entrance of the ward. Rai, daddy gone, daddy gone. I hold mum to the mumbling of nurses and try to compute what's going on. And there you are, behind a closed curtain, unbelievably still. So, you're gone, old man. You're really gone. I touch your chest. Something solid about your chest, something absolute the lack of movement, and I know you're not coming back. I make a pillow of your chest and I lie there. Tears trickle onto this rock. It's only been an hour since they called me and warmth still resides in you like in the morning. The heat left over from the coal fires you made the day before. Fires I'll have to make. Mom wakes me. Right. I was here all the time. I only popped out. I come back as, as something wasn't right. He had lean. I me touch him and he had. And I'm holding my mom as she cries. She bawls. The woman who never left your side. Imagine she has failed you, but you know, you knew what you were doing. And outside Christmas draws near, snowdrops fall lightly and time falls like snow as the world programs itself for celebrations. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Roy, for that really moving, really powerful reading. Um, I think we'll take you a moment to, to sit with that for a bit. Um, thank you so much to everyone for your incredible readings. I think Caroline, are you going to take over now? To yes, I, I, I will. Yes, I, I like you. I um, um, that was um, an amazing uh, final poem, Roy. Um, and um, I think we wanted a moment to just sit sit with it um yeah it's been a, a a fantastic evening thank you to the lit fest for um hosting and and wonderful to see lodestone poets back in action um i'm i'm, I'm looking for i personally i'm looking forward to a return to a, a london venue where we can all see it um but uh, you know i mean this was was amazing and and actually one thing that the pandemic has shown is we can still together and read our poems so uh, I'm looking to see if um, Dave is still here because I know the Lit Fest have got more more events coming up and I don't know if Dave just wants to <coughs> yes in, indeed we do uh, I just want to say as everybody is saying in the chat thank you to all of our poets this evening wonderful wonderful poetry beautifully read Thank you for being so talented and for demonstrably being just so damn alive. Uh, absolutely wonderful. Uh, bless you all. Uh, yes, we have more poetry coming up for you. Uh, on the 29th of March, uh, Alison Brackenbury will be coming to Litfest. Uh, she'll be reading from her recent 10th collection, Thorpe Ness. Uh, and she'll also be sharing with us uh, some poems and stories about the events that inspired them and photographs of members of 
her mother's mother's family who were living and growing up in a village called Chichley, which for those of you dialing in from other parts of the world, is a tiny village about five or six miles away from Milton Keynes. Uh, uh, I, having read the, the, the text and, and seen all the pictures that Alison's already sent through to us, fascinating. Uh, and her poetry is as wonderful as ever. And then on the 26th of April, uh, we will be joined by Luke Kennard, who will be reading from his uh, Ford Prize winning collection, Notes on the Sonnets, uh, which take the inspiration of the Bard's famous work uh, into the 21st century and transport them to a fairly desperate house party somewhere in the, in the Midlands, uh, with Luke's trademark self-deprecating wit and, and love of irony. Um, very clever, very witty, very, very powerfully emotional work in, in Luke's inimitable style. Um, and if any of you actually are in Milton Keynes or nearby, uh, there are a very small number of tickets left for uh, an in-person open mic event at Westbury Arts Centre on the 23rd of April, which uh, is a Paul Shakespeare's birthday, called Sonnets and Soliloquies. Uh, if you're interested in any of those events, go to the website www.mklitfest.org and you'll find links to book yourself virtual or, virtual or real seats for any or all of them. It'd be lovely to see you all there.